could hurt yourself. And sometimes you hurt yourself so bad that it stays with you right through life. Hello? Sometimes you hurt yourself so badly until it stays with you right through life. So you must listen to your parents. All right? Good. It so happens that mother, there was this mother that she has three children. And uh, there was a lake, a body of water. Look this way, please. Hello. Look this way. There is a body of water a little way off from where they live. And so, mother told them that they're not supposed to go to the lake unsupervised. Don't go there when there is no adult there. Somebody older than you are. Don't, another thing that mother said not to do, you tell me. You tell me what your parents say you should not do. You're looking at me in the house. Pardon me? You hear that one? Do not take home things that is not belonging to you. Another one, do not go and turn on the stove. You don't know that one? You don't know that one? Don't play with the batches. You, don't, you never heard it before? Hmm? And don't cross this, the, 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 the street by yourself. Hello? Yes, there's a lot of rules that parents so you do not do because you're not able to manage right now. So she said, do not go down to the lake. Unsupervised. And so it happens that one day, one day, mother had to go out a little bit. And the elders, he could stay there with them. He maybe he was around 12. And the others were younger than he is. And it so happens that mother had to run out to the groceries to pick up something quickly. And she said, you stay here. I won't worry to take you today. You stay here while I go. But no sooner did mother go, you know, like how these days are so hot. You know, the eldest boy starts saying, you know, it is so hot. If I could just get a little dip in the lake. If I could, if we could just go down there to the lake and just get a little swim quickly. She won't even know. She won't even know that we've been in there. Is that safe? No. Somebody say no. Who said no? Hold up your hand if you said no. Somebody said no. Hold up your hand if you say no. All right. I, she said no. So the bigger one who is supposed to be taking care of the little one said, you know, it would be good if you could just go down there. We get a quick swim and we come up. She won't even find out. And so the second one, oldest one said, no. Mother said we are not supposed to go in the lake when there is no adult. And so there's a little one there on tree. She couldn't say much. But the big one persuaded them. And so they went down to the lake. And so while they were there, you know, when, you, when children see water, because water is their first home, you know. Children live in water. Because before that child can be born, your water has to break. And let that water out before the child come. So babies love and children love water. I don't know of any child that don't love water. And so <laughs> it so happens that, you know, the boys jump in the water and they started to play. And soon they started to play sword fight. And they were, you know, enjoying themselves. And then they would, you know, they, they would look for the little one that they put on the bank there to sit down. And she was still there. So they start going down, diving up and coming up and having real fun. Having real fun. But one time when they go down and when they come up, they didn't see their sister. She saw them having a good time. And she wanted to get in the water too, but the water was a bit deep for her, for her legs. 
so she fell in. And so when they look up, they didn't see her, but they just saw when she come up again. But you know, they had a dog. And the dog did not go in the water. The dog sat on the bank. And when they started to get excited, oh my God, oh my God, David, David, wait, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. The dog got in motion. And he jumped in the lake and grabbed the child. Now, when mother came home, everybody was so quiet. You know, usually when your parents come home and, you know, you'd, come to, you'd want to see what they bring for you. But nobody said anything. Everybody just sit down very quiet. Mother knows that something must have happened because this is not the usual them. You know what I mean? And then guess what happened? The dog came in. And the dog just shook himself. And it was like rain. And mother did not say anything still. She was still packing out the grocery, waiting to hear what happened. And so, it so happens that somebody started to cry. The second oldest one started to cry. Couldn't hold the suspense any longer. Mother, you know what happened, mommy, when you weren't here? Mommy was still listening because mommy knows something happened. You know, you said we shouldn't go in the lake when nobody's around, when no adult is around. And you know, Alan says we could go for a quick swim and come up before, you know, you would even find out. And you know, something could happen. And he broke down and he started to cry. Something could happen because Deidre went into the water, had it been for the dog, the pet dog, baby should have died. Mother did not say anything. Mother did not scold them. Mother did not whip anybody because mother knew that they learned a lesson. No, sometimes people don't have to beat you for you, know, for you to learn a lesson. You don't have to get beaten to learn a lesson, you know. Just when something happened that did not have to happen, they learned a lesson that when mother says not to do something, hello? When mother says not to do something, mother knows best. Mother knows best. Mother could be three times as old as you are. If you, even if you're 13 years old, she could be three times as old. She knows danger. And when she said, do not light the stove when she's not there. I do not sneak the matches. I do not do those things. You must listen. It is for your own good. Am I right? I don't want you to shake your head. You know, I want you to answer. Am I right? You must learn to listen. It keeps you out of danger. Do not ride your bike on the road because you don't know how to look out for cars coming. Do not do those things that you hear you must not do. Hello? You agree? If you agree, put up your hand. If you agree with what I'm saying, put up your hand. Because I don't want to hear no little boy get burned up or no little girl get burned up. Hello? And you are not supposed to go and drink from bottles. Bottles can have in different things. They can have in poison. They can have chemical. You must not just take up bottles and drink from it. Hello? There's a lot of things that children mustn't do, you know. But you know, when you're old enough, you'll be able to do them. All right? So this morning, just remember that the word of God said, children must obey their parents, for this is right. It is always right to obey your parents. All right? We bow our heads a prayer. I don't want to be here too long. Father in heaven, we give you thanks. Today, we thank you for the children at the altar. So many things are happening to our children. But today, we ask you to cover these children. And not only these, but all the children in this community. And all the children of the world, because they're all in danger. We pray that you will bless the little children. And that you will help and keep them well and safe. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Building up the temple is that? Building up the temple, building up the temple, building up the temple of the Lord. Brothers want to have us, sisters want to have us. Build up the temple of the Lord. Building up the temple, building up the temple, building up the temple of the Lord. Brothers want to help us, sisters want to help us. Build up the temple of the Lord. Build up the temple, build up the temple, build up the temple of the Lord. Brothers want to help us, sisters want to help us. Build up the temple of the Lord. Build up the temple, build up the temple, build up the temple of the Lord. Brothers want to help us, sisters want to help us. Build up the temple of the Lord. Build up the temple. Building up the temple, building up the temple of the Lord. Brothers want to have us, sisters want to have us. Build up the temple of the Lord. Build up the temple of the Lord. Build up the temple of the Lord. Virgin, I agree to you. Happy Sabbath to you all. Anything that relates to our life and is not completely in God's hand can become a false god. The Greek, Romans, and other ancient people were aware of this because from far them, Mammons are the god of money Imaros, the god of sex, and so forth. We must admit that as human beings, we are addicted to false gods. For example, work is a blessing, but when it becomes the single top priority, it becomes like the god Ephesus it, in our lives. Sex was by God before sin. But when we fail to follow God's established pattern for our sexuality, it becomes a false God like tomorrow's. And one of the th these false gods can destroy our spiritual life. In Romans 1.5, Paul speaks of the human attempt to replace the worship of the one true God with the worship of creation and create creatures. Paul claimed that this kind of worship is based on a lie that will never make a human being truly happy. He calls this kind of attitude foolishness. See Romans 1.22. You must understand that it's crazy to look for true happiness in things and people. Only a foolish wants peace by seeking self-fulfillment. Addiction, addiction are true happiness in financial resource. In God alone, we are tr fully happy. One of the most destructive false God is the God of unbridled pursuit of money. That's why Jesus said, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Luke 16, verse 13. Faithfulness and generosity are the best way to get rid of greed. When we decide to 
faithfully return 10% of our income as a tithe and choose a percentage for the regular ter return of offering. We are allow allowing gods to every day kill the false god of greed that tries to de dom dominate us. Will it be and come forward? Appeal. As, as you return your tithes and offering, ask God to help you kill the false god that are controlling the various aspects of your life. Decide to put God, put, put self first and God first. Let us pray. Most righteous and eternal Father, as we gather here in your presence one more time, to share our blessing that you have given us throughout the week, may we give willingly and receive our blessing in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. There shall be showers of blessings. This is our promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sent for the silver above. Showers of blessings. Showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessings. Precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys. Sound of abundance of rain. Showers of blessings. Showers of blessings we need. Mercy just round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessings, send them upon us alone. Grant to us now a refreshing, come and all our Showers of blessings we need. Mercy's not when the suffering, but for the showers we plead. We give thee but thine home. Whatever thy gifts may be, all that we have is thine own. Trust, O Lord, from me. Amen. Please remain standing for a scripture reading. Our scripture reading will be taken from Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. When you find it, please say amen. amen. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And I read in your hearing. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind to Christ Jesus. Amen. We have reached that time that we, we can put everything to our Heavenly Father. Everything that has been given us problems, everything that is not right in our life, is that time and we need the prayers 
We need lots of it. So hymn number 505, I need the purse. Hymn number 505. of those I love but traveling all nice work at ways that I may true and faithful be and live for Jesus every day I love my friends to pray for me to be so and into see the for me. I need the boys of those I love. Last verse. I want my friends to pray for me to hold me up on wings of faith. Person can need to come to the altar, can come. My friends, to pray for me to bear my tempted soul above and intercede God for me. I need the prayers of those I love. As we petition the throne of God, those who think you want to come a little closer, and those who can kneel, please kneel. Remember, we are in the presence of God. in heaven, creator of heaven and earth, you have been good to us throughout this week. We have not lost any of our members. We praise and adore your holy name. You are so worthy to be praised. This morning I thank you that this day of rest that you have given unto us we can come into your course to worship together. Just place this divine power in your hands that whatever is said and done will be done by the power of your sweet Holy Spirit. And I pray that hearts and mind are together so that the blessings that come down we will receive. Let it not pass us by placing all those who are the altar before you. You know each and every one of them. Their face different. Their needs are different. Some might have the same needs, yes, but you know how much those needs are. And I thank you that you can minister to everyone individually. And you can work for them and chew them. And whatever their necessity is, they come by faith knowing that there's nothing possible that you cannot do for them because you're God of possibilities. So I leave them in your hands and as they stand before you today, they will not go back to their seats the way they came to the altar because they come for a blessing, they come for a touch, they come for a deliverance. So help them not to come, just to come, but to come for a purpose placing every youth in your hands at this time. For you know how much we are yearning after them, more so you, the man Christ Jesus. Especially the youth of the church, we place them all in your hands. 
that they be used as substance, used as examples, so they can be example to the other youths in the wider society and to be witness to them. We place all those that once work with you. We have them to recognize that it's not a bed of rose outside there. They think that everything is all right, but everything is not all right. And as you speak to them and word their conscience and they see what is taking place, they will run to come back to you. And those who never accept you, Lord, that they too will realize that things are not the same as it used to be. And then recognize that something is happening. Noah had warned for so many years and they mock and they cheer. But the day comes when they have to beat on the walls of the ark and call in Father Noah. Help each and every one of us, even us that is here and think we are well secure with you. Help us, Lord, to just put our hearts and minds at the place that the door won't be closed on us, but we will go in openly. Take full control today. Place those who are sick in your hands. We place Sister Queen and Sister Russell and their Sister Gordon in your hands. Not those just of the old of the old soul of faith, but they are members of the community who is sick as well. So many times they are going home, they ask if you pray for them. Or we don't pray for them individually, but when we pray for the community, they are mentioned in the prayer. So prayer as these prayers reach them, they will come to recognize that there is a God to serve, a hell to shun, and a heaven to gain. We place those that lost loved ones in your hands. And at this time, it's not easy for them, but you are their comforter. You are their hope. You are, you are their peace. You are their sympathizing Jesus. So I leave them all in your hands. And then we leave the speaker in your hands in a very special way. You know who he is. And as he comes today, he comes believing that you are God. And as he surrenders life totally to you, and as he stands before this podium, the words that come from his lips is not his words, but the words that come straight from your throne room that will help him and help us to come a little closer to you, to help us to recognize that we are too far from you, we are distant, and you want us to come closer as one in unity, knowing that unity is strength. Just take full control today as you saturate your blood within and without. Each and every one, you can sit beside each and every one. And when this service will have been completed, we can give you thanks because I heard my message. So that each and every one will hear our message. As I tell you thanks, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Hear our prayers, O Lord. In grant us thy peace. Amen. Come back from tough every blessings to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Cover songs of love and praise. Teach me ever to adore thee. May I see. 
while the hope of endless glory fill my heart with joy and love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, it's above the help of calm, and the hope by the good pleasure. Save it to arrive at home. Jesus, help me when a stranger wandered from the fall of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposes precious blood. All to grace, how great a debtor, daily and constrained to be. Let thy goodness the confetter, bind me closer still to be. church but when I'm in my little oh God, how do I put it now my, my little closet the little moment songs like these usually bring me closer because we because I I am just human I know that persons in the congregation probably have their own little song, right? And uh, it bringing them closer. For me, it is uh, three, three, four. Sometimes we know that you feel like you know what nothing. That song does pop up. No, not that I say pop up. That song, uh, the Lord put that song in my heart, in my thoughts, and my lips, uh, and. Uh, when I start to sing it, that feeling just goes away. I know some persons probably have some other songs, right? I know some persons probably have like 330 as their go to song. Some persons might probably have hymn number one or not even a hymn, but a song that brings them closer, something that anchors them in Jesus. So let us sing 330. I know that some pers I know persons might feel John quote tweets, but let us sing that one. Hymn number 330. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands and let them
Hymn number 181, does Jesus care? Hymn number 181. Does Jesus care when the heart is paid too deeply for me to say? As a prayer, as this trace, the way grows weary and Jesus. Hymn number 
Hymn number 516. All the way. Hymn number 516. Needs me, what have I to ask me, sir? Can I dance to send the mercy? Who's your love as with my guide? Heavenly peace, divine, let's go upward. Here by faith, in him to Do it all things well For I know what's happening for me Jesus, do it all things well All the world, my servant needs me Cherish one in path I join Gives me grace for every trial that some of these songs are your go-to songs, am I right? And uh, it is the only song at times us what's other put it us? The Lord has put in your spirit. Just let me have your, your go-to song. So let us sing him around 590 and then we want to hear some of your other's go-to song. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His word, what a glory He shines on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with our sin, and with all who will trust and obey. to trust and obey, not a struggle can rise, not a glory does go, but this man quickly tries it away, not a dog, not a fear, not a Oh, 
Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, just says the Lord. Hymn number 524. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise. Just so the Lord says the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, I will trust in how I believe in my Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, all for grace to trust in me. Trust in Jesus, just to trust is God's in blood, just in simple to need the living cleansing flow. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I believe in my Jesus, precious Jesus, hold for grace to trust in me. Yeah. It's sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sea and safe to cease, just from Jesus simply take it. Life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I believe in more and more. Jesus, 
precious Jesus, precious Jesus, all for grace to trust in more. I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus and the pain. I never felt the was with me. Jesus, all for grace to trust in more. Amen. I know that these songs have been your healer or your reminder that there is a Heavenly Father. I heard that. Hymn number 520. Our wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. Our wonderful Savior to me. He had my soul in the cup. Right, we're just going to sing one verse. And then we have the main, the main, the the main part of the program. Our wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Our wonderful Savior to me. He had my soul in the cloth of the Lord. Where is a pleasure I see? Today is someone that we all know well. Our visitors may not know him, but they will know him in a, in a few moments. He is a youth. He is a man of God, willing to work for our Lord in his pastor. What did I say? That pastor feels, and he is here in the midst of our Heavenly Father. Give us God's message. Church, I am not speaking, I'm speaking of no other than Elder Fo Fo Floyd Powell. Before he comes, to have a song of meditation.
deep for not have I done to merit his grace all glory and praise shall rest upon it so willing to die in my place so I, I will glory in the cross, in the crumb, lest this suffering all be in vain. And I, I will weep no more for the cross that he My trophies and crowns, my robe stains with sin, was all that I had to lay at his feet, unworthy to eat from the table of life. Still love me, provision for me. So I will glory in the cross, in the cross, bless his suffering, all be in vain. I will weep. Shall the church say amen? amen? Let me apologize sincerely. I realized my Pathfinder friend was singing a long time. I caught in the cross and I caught I will glory. I am impressed with the technology of your church. 
I must say, your church is stepping up in time. Let us pray as I watch the clock. And I ask you to bear with me as I try to condense everything the Holy Spirit has put in my mind. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, even now, speak to my mind, speak to my heart. May your words come forth how you want them to come forth. May your glory fill this place. May souls be one for your kingdom. May someone be saved. For this I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our opening song was what? Does Jesus care? And the answer would be what? Oh, yes, he cares. What? His heart is what? Amen. You're talking with me and I'm talking with you. I wish this mic had more juice. Now, when it comes to prayer, you're always told that the answer is yes. Note it. The answer is wait. Don't it? And the answer is no, don't it? Okay. Well, bear with me while I share with you quickly four cases. And you tell me how they fit in. Have you ever heard of the mighty influence of a praying mother? All right. And you know the story of these three boys, I think directors. They were the one who directed the film called Fireproof. Those who are married can watch that film because it speaks volume to issues with marriage. But they directed another film called War Room. What did I say? War Room. Now, in that film, the, one of the directors said they were inspired to do it simply because of their mother. You see, their mother had an experience with her. She related and said when she was six years old, there was a tornado coming towards the house. And all a mother could do was raise her hand in the air and shout for help. I didn't. So, what eventually happened is that out of this experience, the child witnessed the tornado pass the house, damage a barn, damage trees and create ruins. But the house that they were in was not touched. Talk about the power of God. As a result of that, that spring or started a prayer life or activated faith in prayer. And out of this experience, she would now ensure that when she got married, guess what? She was going to choose someone with a similar belief. Shall the young people say amen? amen. Alright. And so, together, 
they have had children. And out of that, the son gave a testimony. And this was the testimony of the son. That everything mommy and daddy pray for. No matter how small it was. And so from this, we can learn valuable lessons. And one of the lessons we can learn is that we can take what? Everything to God in prayer. Another lesson we can learn is that that same story I'm telling you about. When we generally get a yes immediately from God, something happens. We generally don't have problem with this type of answer when God says yes immediately, don't we? Come on, talk to man. Especially if we pray for something specific and we get what we ask for. Turn your Bible to Genesis quickly. Genesis 24. When you're there, please say amen. Are you there? Genesis 24. Amen. We're going to be looking at Genesis 24. Verse 12 to 21. Genesis 24 verse 12 tells us that it says, O Lord God of my what? Master Abraham, I what? Pray thee, send me what? Good speed this day, and, sh and show what? Unto my what? The situation is that in verse 1, the eldest servant of Abraham is prayed. Abraham sent him on a task. And that task is that he must go and get a wife among his kindred, verse 4. Not from the Canaanites. So he's on a mission. On this mission now, it goes on, verse 13. Behold, I stand here by the well of water. And the daughters of the men of the city come out to what? And let it come to pass that when the damsel whom I say, let down thy pitcher, what? I pray that I may what? Drink. And she shall say drink. And I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for my servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast shown kindness unto my master. Verse 15 is the key point. It says, and it came to what? It came to pass before he had what? Done speaking that behold, Rebecca came out who was born to who? Son of who? The wife of who? Abraham's brother with a picture upon her shoulder. Immediately, the answer came. So there are times when we pray, immediately God would answer. Like this lady who raised her hand and shouted out for help. But verse 21, help us to understand something else about this prayer. Because if you go down further, the Bible in verse 16, so the damsel was fear, she looked good. But what the man prayed for, she did exactly everything to the point in verse 21, it says what? The man did what? He wondered at her and held his peace. To which whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. He wondered, can I believe? 
Follow me carefully. The lesson we can get from this, notice, this type of prayer was specific. When we pray, we must make sure we are specific. And it teaches us to say only what we need. When Abraham, elder servant, prayed, what God was doing? God was not only strengthening his faith, not it, but what about the mother who prayed? And the little girl saw it, little six year old saw it. What was happening to this little six year old? <laughs> Think about it. And here is where now I make a suggestion. Let me suggest to you, for that six-year-old, when she saw her mother hand in the air, calling out God as a tornado approached the house, witnessing the tornado passing and leaving the rooms behind, witnessing the house still intact, her family all well, I want to challenge you to tell you that this. Leave a deep impression on our mind about prayer. It had such an impact that it affected the way she was going to live. And those you can clearly see, she made her a part and parcel of her family legacy. What can we learn? One, take everything to God in prayer. Two, our children must see us opening our heart to God as a friend. Our children must see us when we are vulnerable crying out to God. As we pray, our children must see us acknowledging our weakness and relying on God's strength. As we pray, our children could, must see sincere, or sincerely talking to God frequently and building a close relationship with God. And as we do these things, we cause our children faith to God to be awakened or strengthened by prayer. But also, we pass on a legacy of prayer to the next generation. Child of church say, Amen. Amen. Now, case number two. Because of time, I will just summarize case number two to you. Today, in the quarterly, the, 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 let me talk about first in the Advent Mission World Story. You can go online and type in Adventist Mission Story for Adults. And you, the, the, the one for, let me do the one for children. The one for children, rather. The one for children. When you type that in, April 13th, it said that you must read that story to the children. Surprisingly, it was talking about prayer as well. Okay? And that is what? April when? 13th. No, it says praying problems away from Adventist World Mission Children's Story. Now, it speaks about an 11-year-old boy. This 11-year-old boy was struggling with all work and his, on his computer. So he wasn't able to solve the man's problem. He found that it was difficult and hard. He tried for 10 minutes, couldn't solve it. So guess what he did? He left the living room, went to his father, and said, Daddy, look here, I can't solve the problem. His father said, all right, followed him back to the computer. His father, his father tried to solve it. The father couldn't solve it. And you know what the father said? Let's pray, he said. God can solve this problem. He definitely will help you. Now, interestingly enough, the father was basically following 
the outline I mentioned just a while ago. Because the father bowed his head, closed his eye. They, they, when they bowed their head, closed the eye, it says, here's a prayer. Dear God, Father prayed, thank you for being with us. You know that Daniel needs to solve this man's problem. We can't figure it out, but you can. Please help us. Amen. Was it specific? Did the father show his, that he was vulnerable? Was the father acknowledging his weakness and relying on God's strength? Was the father sincerely talking to God and opening up his heart to God as a friend? Yes, he was. And out of that experience, when they opened their eyes, guess what happened? Little boy looked at the screen, and within no time he solved the problem. Immediately it was answered. But guess what happened now? And next time, two days later, some more mad problem came. He's struggling. Can't solve it. Call daddy. Daddy do the same thing. And guess what happened? Then pray and guess what happened? He couldn't solve the problem. <laughs> Have you ever encountered an experience where you pray, you thought you would get an immediate response, and you don't get an immediate response? What do you do? Do you, do, do you continue? Well, this little boy, guess what happened? Father left him, you know? The father left him, went back, and the father only saw him running in. And said, Daddy, I solved it. What do you think God was doing for this child? Why did God allow the child to wait some time before the problem was solved? Let me suggest to you that God does these things in our life sometimes. And I'm going to use two stories of waiting. I'm going to talk from memory and use the Bible text because time is short. One of the person who had to wait on God was Abraham. Don't it? Tell me about the quick little Genesis. Or if you know, you can tell me. When Abraham got the promise in Genesis 12, how oh, old was Abraham? Look at verse 4. How oh, old was Abraham? No man. In Genesis 12, he was 75. Who? Cool. Say, follow me. So I'm going to use the Bible then. Now, God made several promises to him. Right? The, the promise of God, God was specific with the promise. God said, look here. He's going to bless him. That means he's going to get a child. But later on in the verse, when we go down to verse 6 and 7, God now adds something else. When Abraham came into the land and said, be an idol worshiper, he started wondering if he was in the right place. So God now encouraged him by saying, look here, man, in verse 7. Look at verse 7. Unto thy seed I will give what? This land. So God is saying, look here, auntie. So there are two things now that is clear. You go get a child, and then you go get what? The land. But then a famine came in verse 10. And after the famine, he encountered situation in Egypt where he told that his wife is his sister. Then he encountered situation where he had to leave Egypt rich. And he and Lot had a strife. Her husband had a strife. And Lot separated. But then in chapter 13, God make sure to tell him, say, in verse 15, 16 onwards, God said, look here, may I go give you the land. You see, look here, the, the, this land you see, if you, when you walk all the bread, I'm going to give it to you. Then right after that, war take place in verse 14. 
He had to rescue his, 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 um, his nephew out of that. And then, in verse chapter 15, guess what happened now? God have to strengthen him because in his mind, he's saying, look here, the child are born, you know. And me go fight with my men them. I will go down here so and fight. So he started to worry the child about it. A war, war go on. And God had to strengthen him. And God had to say to him, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Follow me carefully. Then now, in puppet from God, I said, God, look here. We are going, then I have no child. The person who is going to get the thing is my servant Eliezer, the same one that break. And what did God do? Did God tell him, say, look here, Abraham, you're going to get the child X, Y, Z? No. God only gave him reassurance. So God is saying, you have to wait. Follow me carefully. With the land. When he asked about the land in verse 6, 7, and 8, did God give him any reassurance about the land? Yes. What God did, if you look in verse 13, let me read it for you. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be what? A stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and shall be afflicted them how many years? Four hundred years. So God, tell him how long he see you'd have to wait. He says, going on. Good. No. Then God tell him, say, look here, in verse 14. They are going to go through some situations. They are going to be in there. They're going to be served. But he is going to come and judge the nation. And they're going to come out with great substance. Verse 15. He said that, look here, you're going to die before. But in the fourth generation, when the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full, he made it clear that they shall come out. Why am I saying all this? God reach us where we are to take us where he wants us to be. God work with us where we are. So God is working with Abraham. Just as our God work with the children in our church and believe it, God is working with us too. He knows we're not there. He's taking our time with us and working with us. So he's working with Abraham. So bit by bit, he gives him some information. He lets him wait. But why? Because God realized that there's something in Abraham that he needs to change. You see, God is more interested in changing us than giving us things. So when we pray, we pray for care, hopes, learn. No, God more interested in doing what? Changing us than giving us things. I hope this change your perspective on prayer. Let me tell you why. We're going to use the same story to tell you why. Because all along, Abraham is doing these wonderful feats and so forth. But when you look in chapter 16, verse 3, it tells you, And Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Agar, her handmaid, after Abraham had dwelt how many years? Ten years. It means, therefore, Abraham is now 85. Because 75 and 10 give you what? So he's now 85. And Abraham... 16 verse 1. Look what Abraham do you know? The Bible says no. Sarah, Abraham's wife, bear no children. Follow me carefully. She bear no what? Children. So she hand over her husband to the Egyptian to have a child. The question is this. As we wait, are we waiting and are we ensuring that we are waiting and we are going according to God's will? Was that what was Abraham was doing? Let me submit to you, no. Abraham was not going according to God's will. That is why in chapter 17, when Abraham is 99 years old, what did the Lord say to him? The Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am, no, Almighty God, do what? 
walk before me and be no perfect. Follow me carefully. Follow me carefully. Yes, sister, you're getting it. So watch this now. To show you that Abraham was not walking perfect. I'm going to trouble you now. Is it that Abraham couldn't pray for his wife? Why did he pray for her? She parent? Why did the Bible never say any Abraham? Look, if you read through, there's nothing that says Abraham pray for his wife. But yet, the Bible in James called Abraham a friend of God. Hey, hey sister, you're getting it. If he's a friend of God, and we say prayer, is opening up the heart to God as a friend. It means that he must have prayed. Follow me carefully. But not only that. How comes his servant know to pray? Because the Bible tells us that everybody that was in Abraham household, he command, God said him command him household. Don't it? You see what I want? So it means, therefore, Eliezer would have been influenced by his prior life. His son would have also been influenced by his prior life, Isaac. Because when Isaac was 40, and his, and his wife could not have a baby, the Bible tells us, Isaac did what? Entreat, he prayed, because of time I'm going to rush, I'm going to look for the scripture passage. So therefore, Abraham knew to pray. In fact, when Abimelech when Abraham went down, remember the first time Abraham, somebody said, told a lie? He did it again 20 years after. Don't it? He go back down to, and he, and, but he go back to a different place 20 years after. Abimelech. And what happened? He said he thought the fear of God was not in this place. But what happened? When he realized basically, what happened? Abraham prayed, the Bible says, for who? Abimelech and Waham. Who can tell Waham? Eh? And the Bible said that they are what? The wounds of Abimelech were home. So if it is that Abraham could have prayed, I want to read it for you. Alright? Before you go any further. Because I see you, I see you quiet on me. Alright? And I don't want to go to the, to the thing. It says... Here it is. Genesis 20, verse 17. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maid servant, and their be children. You see what's going on now? So if that is the case, and we understand, what is God doing? God is allowing Abraham to do a wait. He's teaching Abraham that he has to wait. Why would God teach us to wait? Let's think about let's reason about it now. By waiting, Abraham was going to set an example for his son. So when his son was in the same situation, his son would look back and say, God, you came to my, fa to my father. I'm going to wait. And in waiting, it does what? It builds patience. The trying of our faith does what? It builds patience. How oh, important is patience? Patience is very important. It's a virtue, it's more than a virtue. Because when time, there's a time coming that we are going to need patience like no other. There's a time coming that we're going to need the peace of God. And if you don't believe me, let me prove it to you. I will stop reading and I will talk with you quickly. When Moses came on the scene. Remember just a while ago, the children of Israel will be in, in 400 years in bondage. The time came for a deliverer. How did Moses know that he was a deliverer? Think about it. Think about it. Because events that happened will clearly indicate that Moses was a deliverer. First of all, he was what? Three months old. They hid him, don't it? Because his parents fear God. And he was a goodly child. After that, who found him? Fear daughter. When she found him, 
Waham. Yes, I mean. But we know Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh. Pharaoh daughter, right? Meaning that when the child was brought to her, she basically she needs someone to care for the child. And what happened out of that? The sister that was there. Good. And the sister name was what again? Miriam. And what happened out of that now is that now here's your double whopper. Miriam, mother, is going to now nurse the child and get money. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> Our own child and get money. No, the Bible said that she an Hebrew woman. So she's going to educate the child along the what? Hebrew line. But when the child was brought to fear a daughter, the Bible said that fear a daughter, he became fear a daughter what? Son. What does it mean by he became fear a daughter son? Should I teach him? I love what the sister said. I promise this, I want to go to the, but, but quickly, Acts, Acts 7, Acts 7. Quickly, Acts 7. I'll, I'll, you need to look on this quickly. Acts 7. Will you hear please say amen? All right. Acts 7. Now, Steve is telling the story and relating the story in Acts 7. Now, ask, it's Acts 7, verse 20. It says, In which time Moses was born and with seemingly fear and nourished up in his father's house. How many months? And when he was cast out, fear was what? And nourished him for her. Watch this now. And Moses was what? And Moses was what? And was what? Do you understand what that means? He had a PhD. <laughs> He's a scholar in Egypt chanting. Mighty in words and indeed it means also any part of government, any part of army. He was there, the biggest thing. She made sure he got the, the biggest thing that you can think about. Now, watch this now. After she did that, what happened to him? We know what happened. We know, this is the part I want you to read now, and then I stop. It says, and when he was all old, it came into his heart to do what? Visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seen one of them do what? He defended him and avenged him, and was what? And what? Smart the Egyptian, 25. For he what? Suppose his brethren would have what? Hold that what? Would what? Deliver them. But what? So he understood that he was going to deliver them. At what point, therefore, did he change and decide to go home to visit them? He used to tell us that by faith, Moses did what? Instead of call what? The son of fear daughter, he chose what? Rather to what? Suffer affliction. With the people of God, it meant that sometime during those 40 years, Moses had made up his mind that he was going to suffer affliction. Moses made up his mind and recognized that, look here, my life, was, my life wasn't by accident or chance. Looking at how things set out, I am going to be the one to deliver. But he went about it the wrong way. <laughs> that was not the way God wanted him to do it. And as a result, that he had to flee. And when he flee, the Bible said, how long did he stay in the wilderness? In the same text. In the same text. In the same text. It says here, in verse 30, verse 29, then, Mo then fled Moses at the same, and was a stranger in the land of Median, where he begot two sons, and when he was what? There appeared unto him what? In the wilderness of Mount Sinai. So when he was fought after 40 years, so he spent 40 years there. 
Why did he spend 40 years there? Why God make him wait so long? The truth is, when you look, when Moses ran away, Moses' heart was still set on Egypt. How do we know? His first son name is what? Eliezer. What does it mean? Alien or stranger in a strange land. <laughs> so Moses found himself a stranger in a strange land. When Moses came down, and, and, and when he fled, remember what happened? Zippor, um, Jethro's daughter were coming down to the well. Who remember that? And what happened? Who, who defended them? Moses defended them. No. When she go back to her father, she say what? She never said Hebrew defended them, you know. She said an Egyptian, that means Moses dressed like an Egyptian, could have talked like an Egyptian, walked like an Egyptian. Do you see the danger of education? Wrong education. Here, you take a child and him over. And now he's what? Full. And then he's saying, when he goes back into the wilderness, he's saying, look here. He's a stranger in a strange land. Mercy. Now, do you understand why God had to make Moses wait 40 years? Because Moses had to unlearn things that he had learned. He could not be the deliverer that God wanted. I said, you what God now would have to change Moses. And that's why I started off by saying sometimes you're waiting is because God wants to change you. God is more important than changing you than giving you things. I hope that is solid. Wrapping up. Not only does God want to change you. Make your way. But there are times when God said no. That part is rough, don't it? <laughs> You know, my wife was telling my daughter, um, I, hear, I overheard her talking to my daughter, and she was giving her a testimony, said that when she was praying for her husband, she wanted a tall man. <laughs> Question! Did God say yes? Did God say wait? God said no, fierce fox! Church of God, living God, face facts. No. The same Moses who led the children. Watch this time to the Moses now. God sent him and said, Moses, here I am. I'm going to send you down. Now we know the story already of Moses. Oh Lord, I can't speak so forth. But God eventually got down. And we know what happened when he went down. We know that they were what? Him and fear, and how many plagues? Oh, how many plagues came out of that? Ten plagues. So name some of the plagues then quickly. Flies there, where's again? Eh? Lies, where's again? Frogs, where's again? That was the last one, where's again? Water turn. So you get the picture. So there were plagues. No, question. Did the people saw all of these? Children, all right. Question, were the children of Israel affected by any of them? No, the Bible, if you're going to read the Bible back again, it says, what did happen to them over here? In Goshen, nothing happened to them. Can you believe that? Hear you now. It says that there was darkness all around, but in the Hebrews house there was light. Imagine today, you didn't know your yard. And you have light, and you never have no light. I'm being darkness. Wouldn't they say, boy, something wrong? Yeah. Eh? So God was glorifying himself, but at the same time saying, look here, these are my people, I am the true God. Yeah. So when God came for them, and God took them out by a mighty hand, and carried them out, how did they know that God was leading? There was what, a pillar? Come on, church of God. <laughs> and, and, and they might what? Night it was what? So they knew that God was leading. And the Bible said, anywhere they took their journey, truly the journey, God was leading them. So God reaches us again where we are. God did not take them the different route. Why? The Bible says, let's pray adventure that their enemies, the Philistines, would come and say, look here, them slaves escape. Let's go up and attack them. 
So out of care and love, God was leading the two sides quickly. Right after that, by the way, how many times them provoke God? God, God said, these ten, at one time God said, these ten times you have provoked me. And, oh, and poor Moses. If Moses was the same Moses and God did not change him the 40 years, Moses would have. <laughs> if, look here, Moses was a murderer, you know? Moses was a bad boy, you know? When, him, when, him, when Moses drove off the shepherds, and uh, uh, this Bible says shepherds, it means that Moses alone would stand up and defend the girl um, with the shepherds. So you must understand the type of Moses, the person Moses was. But what did God do? God was changing Moses for this mission. And Moses was going to depend upon God. And as a result of that, during every single trial, what did Moses do? Moses ran to God and seek God. Notice. Whoa, we thirsty. We want water. Whoa, we want meat. They were not hungry enough. The Bible says they were they fell the lost in numbers and psalms. That means they wanted meat. The Bible said they wanted the fish. They wanted it. And the Bible said there was a mixed multitude who encouraged them in the church. So there was a group, a group of group of who start and then and then after that, worse again, and next time again. No water. Worse again they do to God. <laughs> Out there. Huh? The one that the calf, the Moses go up. And they must they see the cloud, you know. They see everything, you know. And they must say, Boy, yeah, well, no man can stop stay up, stay up this for 40 days and 40 nights. You ain't dead. <laughs> and them start. So sister, they saw everything that God did in Egypt. God was there working with them. They saw everything. They saw that God was leading. And Moses, because God was working on him too. Can remember, you know, God the fish work on Moses, you know. God take us where we are. He keeps taking us where we are and carrying us where he wants us to be. But what happened? Moses, one of them, one of them, Moses slipped and did not follow what God said he must do. And what happened? Moses never get to go over into the promised land. Moses wanted to, but God said what? No. When God says no, it challenges him. When God says no to your prayer, it challenges you. It makes you, it make you, all your life, this is what he was going for, and God says no. I want to say, look it, speak to me no more on the matter. <laughs> what about our life when God said no? Tell the truth. It mush up every fiber in our way. <laughs> we can't understand. But I want to reassure the church of God that when God says no, God is giving us our best. You can't understand that? Watch this now. If Moses had known that when he died, God, Jesus Christ was going to come and resurrect him and carry him straight to heaven. Moses would have said, Yeah, man, we can't take my Tell me, Jesus. <laughs> Tell the truth. If you, which one would you prefer? To go over to Canaan and die and wait for the second coming? Or to die now? <laughs> and then Jesus. Come for you. No, we are not teaching that when persons die, they go straight to heaven. Because we know that. We know that we sleep. But in that case, there was a special, re special resurrection. Why? Because it gives us the assurance, those of us, in the last days, when the Bible says, when the, and the dead in Christ shall rise. Come on. It gives us the assurance that we have the right message and we have the right gospel. So simply... By saying no, again it helped us today, but it also shows that God 
gives the best gift and something better. One more, and we close. What about Joshua? Joshua now had to take the people and carry them into the promised land. And sometimes as Christians, we have high days, don't it? We are on cloud night. Sometimes it's like God is with us and he's walking and he's carrying us and he's guiding us. There's this song that this lady sings, an African song that says something like, this year, Lord, you go ahead of us. This year, Lord, you are aligning everything. This year, the land will heal for us. I walk in all God has for me. I declare. And then she says, I have no fear. When you think of that song, that song is really saying, look here, God, anything may set out for me. Anything, this year may I claim it. I will have no fear. That was the attitude of Joseph. Can you believe that? I mean, jo Joshua rather. When you look at Joshua, didn't, didn't Jesus, didn't, didn't, wait, who appeared to him? The captain of the Lord's host said, I have come now. But before that, what did he say? He said, look here. I am going to magnify you. I am going, the things, he encouraged Joshua to the point that he said, look here. None of them, none of them will stop you. That's encouragement and strengthening because Moses has left. But even before they crossed the Jordan, Joshua was strengthened already. You know how? Because when they sent out the spies, who came? They came to Rehab house. And Rehab, what did Rehab say? Rehab is a new convert. Rehab, the new convert. <laughs> He said, look here, me here, about the God. Me here when I'm doing Egypt. Me here when I'm doing to the kings them, Amorite kings. The iniquity of the Amorite was now full. <laughs> Come on, church, follow me. Me here, me believe, and here we know, here we know that faith must work. She said, after she said that, she said, look here now. She pleaded with them, save me and my family. If she never believed, why would she say, save us? It means that when we have faith, faith must work. And out of that experience, Waham, out of that experience, Waham, his confidence grew. When the spies come back and tell him. He had another incident. Where his confidence grew. But something happened. Something happened. There are times when we get encouragement. There are times when we get boots or confidence. And what did he do? AI. He said, look here. We're going to go down and we're going to take that city AI. 5,000. Oh, man. 2,000, 3,000 guys come back. They go down. And they were defeated. Why were they defeated? Some would say that, look here, the Bible says that because sin was in the camp. And God did tell them, so they never take any accursed things. But question, wasn't sin in the camp before? Wasn't sin in the camp before? So he had them and said, oh, let them from the time they never had no sin. <laughs> Sin was there. And I agree that there was a method to deal with sin. That's why they had the tabernacle and so forth. But let me propose to you that what really happened is that he did not consult God. Many times as Christians, we are on a high and we don't consult. You know when you consult God? It's after the Bible said he go <laughs> and he are complaining. <laughs> And I wonder, at that time in prayer, but before he did not include God, overconfidence as Christians sometimes. And what happened? What's the end result? We know that when he seek God, God answer. And the last one, 
the Gibeons. They came down and shook him. Did they consult God? No, the Bible said they did not consult God again. And they were tricked. So how important it is for us as Christians to consult and seek God. How important is that? It's very important. And so, what is prayer all about? In a nutshell. When God says yes, it simply means that God is helping your faith to grow. It simply means that God is moving you from strength to strength. Sometimes God has to awaken faith in some areas in our life. Because there are persons who don't, who don't believe in certain things. When God says wait, there's a stage. So God take time and say, all right, you're moving now. And so you move the stage now where you wait. What is God doing? Again, God is helping you to perfect um, your faith to mature. God is helping you to be patient. The fruits of the Spirit are going to come. And when God says no, what is God really doing? When God says no, that's the part we're going to end with. When God says no. When God says no, let me, let me just say it to you. That when God says no, and we're challenged, and every fiber in our being, I want to just say to you that God has got it. Number one, God has got this. He's saying, don't worry. You see what happened to Moses? I'm working things out for your best. When God says no, what God is really doing, God is giving us victory. And you might say, then, oh God, for say no, and he might give me victory. That no nah, make any sense, Brother Powell. I submit to you that when God says no, he's giving you victory. And you might say, what victory? Here's what I put down in pen. It says that victory in prayers are best seen when God says no. When God says no, and this challenge every fiber in our being, we're challenged to ask the question, does Jesus care? And then we will learn the answer if we accept no, that no matter how painful, we will acknowledge to the world that we trust his omniscience and his love and care in our life. So in doing that, what we're doing, we truly glorify God when God says no and we, and we take the plan. When God says no, even when our plans with what God intended and say no, just like with Joshua, if God says no to our plans, then remember, God is giving us our best and nothing less. So the thing is, we can sing, oh what peace we often forfeit, oh what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. The journey and the battle plan. The journey I've described. And the battle plan is simply this. As God's agent, you are to yield yourself to him. That when he may plan and direct and fight the battle for you, you just cooperate. Oftentimes our plan fails. That God's plan for us may succeed. Simply. Yield yourself to him, that he may plan and direct and fight the battle for you. You cooperate, and then Philippians 4, 6 will make, make, make every sense to you. When God says wait or when God says no. It says be careful for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. 
Let what? Your request be made known to God. And the result, and the peace of God, which pass all understanding, shall do what? Guard your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Just remember, God has got this. God is always taking us where, from where we are to where we want to be. God is more interested in changing us. God wants to give us victory. Accept no, no matter how painful. Acknowledge him, and you will help to vindicate his character. I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing the closing hymn, 530. second coming of Christ. There is coming a time when Christ is going to come back. There is coming a time when the Bible tells us in Revelation that he that is filthy will mean filthy. He is unjust will mean unjust. There is coming a time when Christ is going to leave the sanctuary. There is coming a time when he'll rise from the most holy place, lay off the meditorial garments, and close himself with the garment of vengeance. The question is this. In that time when there is no intercessor, how will you stand in that great day? If you are here today, you have heard and understand how important it is for you to have God's peace. Because without God's peace, come be well with your soul in that time. If you are here and you are contemplating, just thinking about it, and you want that peace, I'm going to say to you, if you need prayer, I'm going to ask someone to pray for you. Just come to the altar as we sing. The last stanza. And no one is that when my face shall be sad, the house be wrapped as a scroll. The
thing I'm going to say to the church of God. You are baptized, but a while ago the Holy Spirit showed you. And you saw where there's some lacking. You recognize that you have not been waiting properly on the Lord. You recognize that really when God says no, it's simply because he's giving you the best. You recognize the children of Israel, the merman, the complain. And you recognize also that even those who are walking as Moses walked can slip. You recognize also that we can become overconfident in victories and leave ourselves vulnerable. You recognize the importance of leaving a legacy for our children and you have not been doing that as it relates to prayer. Then I'm asking you, let us come together at the altar as we ask the Lord for mercy, pardon. When peace like a river attended my way, when souls like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, the last Righteous Heavenly Father, even now you have laid so many things on individual minds. Some may not have heard everything, but Holy Spirit, what you have allowed to impress upon the hearts and the mind, we pray that you will bring conviction. We pray in a special way that when you say no, we'll understand clearly that for those who will be alive when Christ comes, those who have a relationship with Christ will have to stand without an intercessor. Help us to understand that no prepares us for such time so that we will not become impatient as Moses did. That we'll be able to bear the trials that are locked to us. Because by practice and precept, the character of Jesus will be formed in us. Help us truly to understand in those times that truly you want to vindicate your character. And no wonder Daniel says, those who will stand that time will shine. You're supposed to understand, Heavenly Father, when you say no, we're giving you the glory. We're telling the world that, like Moses, who went up, that we'll trust your all name and we trust your love. Moses just went up and took no and was laid to rest. Help us to understand as we wait, the waiting is for good. All these things, the scripture passages were aligned. Help us to go back and to recognize that you're preparing us for better things. And so while things 
we need it. Truly you want to change our heart so we can have a heart like Christ. So be with your church in this regard. Be with us as a people. And when time shall be no more, may every person in this room, children, boy, girl, old, young, because we are chosen today, as Joseph, as Joshua said, choose ye this day. We are saying we will serve the Lord. Let that be our commitment. Seal it, dear Lord, today. For this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen, church. It has been, I don't say has been, that message I got is powerful. And it has, and I hope that the, each part of the message reach the hearts of persons in the hearing of his voice. The song to lead out is hymn number 633, When We All Get to Heaven. Hymn number 633. Sing the Lord, just love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansion, bright and blessed, he prepared for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout a victory. While we walk the pilgrim's pathway, cross with overspread the Woo! <laughs>